people in the Senate on both sides of the aisle, the majority of whom want to see a resolution to this impasse. Well, the time is now for all of us to compromise and to do what's in the best interests of this country. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. The Senator from Georgia. Mr. President, today when the chaplain opened the Senate, he prayed for divine guidance to end the paralysis of analysis in Congress. I thought it was an excellent point, and when I heard the two leaders speak today, I realized where that paralysis really was. We were paraly paralyzed by analyzing our differences and failing to look at what we've reached common ground on already. I have been worried about a default on our debt for some time, but right now I'm worried about Congress defaulting on our country. Failure should not be an option for us in this case, and it's time we started finding common ground. So for the purpose of discussion, I really want to put forward some thoughts about where we agree, some identification of where we don't, but where we could be. We've already agreed in one form or another, whether it was the vice president's group or the speaker's group or whoever, that we ought to have a trillion dollar down payment and initial cuts to bring about deficit reduction. And there's common agreement between both sides in the Senate and I think in the House as well, that we need a short-term committee equally divided in a partisan way to come up with at least another 1.8 trillion that results in reductions in debt and in deficit. We've agreed on those two things. Third, we've agreed that we don't want to default on our debt. There may be a handful of people around here who think that's a good idea, but with all due respect, it's not a good idea. And the ramifications of default are already showing themselves in, in small measures in the markets, but will show themselves a lot greater next Wednesday if we fail. Now, where do we differ? We don't differ on raising the debt ceiling. We just differ on when we raise it, how we raise it, and how long we raise it. The president favors raising it past the election in November of 2012. There are others that want to have votes every six months or ten months. Quite frankly, there is something to be said for waiting until after the November election of 2012. So we have 18 months of stability and predictability in the United States of America. There's not the uncertainty of us coming back. There's a lot of differences on the other side about whether we have a constitutional amendment on the balanced budget vote. And quite frankly, I can't understand why in the end anybody would reject both bodies being able to have a vote in regular order on a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. We are supposed to vote. We're supposed to confront those decisions. And I think an agreement could be reached between those two differences that would ensure us moving closer to an agreement on the entire package. And then third and probably toughest, we don't disagree on the committee that's appointed to find the 1.8 or better in, in savings and cuts, but we disagree on the mechanism in which that is enforced. And I want to talk about that for a minute. There's a fear, and a lot of it's justified because of the way we're acting right now, that if you had a committee of 12, six Democrats and six Republicans, charged with finding 1.8 trillion or more in reductions, they'd never agree, therefore they'd be gridlocked, therefore those reductions would not take place. And I understand that fear and agree with the concern for that fear. So you need a mechanism where there's, there's a risk for them to do that. One of the discussions that's been floating around was last night, a discussion I had, in fact, with the presiding officer right now, is you, create, you allow the Congress itself to allow an equal number of Democrats and Republicans of some accountable number, like 10 or 20, to come together if the committee fails to make its recommendations and alter, make alternative recognitions that must, by requirement of the law, be voted on on the floor of the House and Senate. Now, if for some unbelievable circumstance that didn't happen, there has to be an absolute fail-safe to ensure that failure is not an option. I have suggested automatic sequestration, and I know that causes heartburn with some. But somewhere there's a silver bullet. The Lone Ranger had it. Tano had it. Billy Wyatt Earp had it. Why can't the U.S. Congress find it? Why can't we find that magic bullet that is the enforcement mechanism that ensures we come together on the 1.8 trillion or more? If we do those things, we have an agreement. We've already agreed in principle on most of them, and we understand our differences on the ones we haven't agreed on. We ought to be spending the next 24 hours finding out where our differences are and coming to find common ground, because we are not that far apart. 
So I want to go back to the prayer of Barry Black this morning. And I listen to his prayer just about every morning because it's very insightful. In fact, there's a clear message in it. And he's usually talking to all of us because he watches all of us. And he, he's concerned, and I'm concerned. I have three children and nine grandchildren. I've said in my campaigns the rest of my life is about leaving them a country that is as prosperous, as free, and as great as the country my left, parents left me. If we blink on this issue that's before us, that's not going to be the case. There's irreparable harm that can come from a failure to act. And it doesn't harm me as a politician. It harms my kids and my grandkids. And it harms those people I know that are on Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. And it harms those people I know that are standing right now on a firing line somewhere in Afghanistan, realizing today could be their last day on this earth so America could live to see another day. That's how serious the consequences are. So, Mr. President, I would suggest that instead of being paralyzed by our analysis of where we differ, let's become analysis of where we find common ground. And we do on not raising the debt ceiling. We know we should raise it. We know we can find up to 2.8 trillion and hopefully more in cuts in the deficit and spending over time. We know for a fact we have to extend the debt ceiling to some point in time. And if it's past the presidential election of 2012, let's ensure that each body, in regular order, can vote on a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. Which leaves us with one difference. And that difference is, what is the enforcement mechanism on the $1.8 trillion cut that the Joint Committee, equally divided, is supposed to come on? I submit we can find the common ground to find the silver bullet that causes that to happen. And I would encourage all of us to forget now where we differ, to recognize where we agree, and then work on building a bridge on those differences so the United States of America doesn't default on its debt and the Congress of the United States does not default on its obligation to the people of the greatest country on the face of this earth, the United States of America. And Mr. President, I yield back my time and suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. And the Senate here in a special weekend session working on Majority Leader Harry Reid's bill to deal with the debt and deficit. They've been in 30-minute blocks of speeches that's expected to go through 7.30 Eastern Time. And usually on C-SPAN 2, we bring you Book TV over the weekend. We'll be bringing you Book TV programs when the Senate is in recess. And you can always watch online at booktv.org. Just a little more about the Senate today. Much of the day will be spent discussing the Senate Democratic and House Republican debt ceiling plans. Because of Senate rules, 30 hours must pass before the Senate can vote on moving forward with the Reid plan, which puts the vote at about 1 a.m. Eastern time, though senators could agree to hold that vote earlier. The Senate blocked the House plan that was laid out by Speaker John Boehner last night by a vote of 59 to 41. And Senator Reid then started the process to bring his version of the bill to the floor. The Reid plan would increase the debt limit by $2.4 trillion through 2012. Speaker Boehner's plan would have increased that limit by $2.5 trillion in two stages. Both set up a congressional committee to recommend more cuts down the road. The House will also vote on Senator Reid's plan at about 2 p.m. Eastern. You can watch live coverage of the House on our companion network, C-SPAN, and live coverage of the Senate right here on C-SPAN 2.
Mr. President, the discussion has boiled down to a desire by the President to have the largest debt increase in the history of America at a time when our spending is out of control and this debt ceiling limit that we've now reached is at a point where it does need to be raised, but I thought we had a national consensus that as part of raising the debt ceiling, we would begin to change our habits around here. We would do things better. We wouldn't be running up so much debt because every witness has testified before our budget committee has said we are on an unsustainable path. And they mean that. You cannot sustain the debt path we're on. We've never been in a deeper fix. But the president wants this huge debt increase, but he only wants to have a very modest in decrease in spending. So the bill that's before us would decrease spending about $927 billion. This might, might sound like a lot, but over the next 10 years, according to the Congressional Budget Office, we will increase the debt of America by $10 trillion, $10,000 billion, not $927, and that won't change the debt trajectory. We've got to have more than $900 plus billion in spending reductions, and since we're not going to be able to get that, it appears, because the Democratic majority in the Senate won't allow it, and they're saying we're prepared to shut the government down if you try to produce cut any more, then we've got to keep talking. We've got to continue the dialogue and the debate about the debt course we're on, so we should not have the largest increase in debt, the debt in history. Indeed, that would just give a blank check to the big spenders. They could run for two years. And why is it so important to get a longer debt bigger debt ceiling increase, and I also thought and believe we have an agreement that the debt ceiling shouldn't be increased more than spending is decreased. Spending decreased over 10 years, you, you cut it a trillion dollars, you raise the debt ceiling a trillion dollars. We give you 10 years but on spending cuts, but immediately you get a trillion dollar increase in the debt ceiling. Why are we in this fix? This is why. I hate to say it. This is why. There's no doubt about it. The president said last week, the only bottom line that I have is that we extend this debt ceiling through the next election until 2013. Through the next election. It's all about him. It's about politics. It's about his desires, what he wants. But that's not correct. This is about America, what's good for our country. The House of Representatives submitted a fabulous budget, I thought, earlier this year. It reduced spending by as much as $6 trillion over 10 years. This bill would only reduce it $1 trillion. Why would the House of Representatives after much, much, much bait, pleading, soul-searching, why would they agree to send a bill over here that only does $1 trillion in, spence, in spending cuts over 10 years? The reason is they love our country. They know this is a dangerous time. They know at this point in history, we don't need to create more uncertainty on top of the tremendously dangerous debt path we're on. By not raising the debt limit, we don't know for sure what will happen. Bad things could happen. So they've made a tremendous compromise in what they proposed and sent it over here. But the only thing the president cares about is not having to talk about this again until after he gets reelected, I suppose. So I think uh, uh, we need to understand something. This is not enough reduction in spending. 900 
billion dollars, a thousand billion dollars is not enough. It will not change a debt trajectory that we're on now, which is on the path to do from nine to thirteen trillion dollars more in debt added to our nation's books in ten years. It's just not enough. So, uh, we get our debt ceiling, we get out of this immediate crisis, at least we do that, and we send a message to the world and to the American people and to the uh, financial markets that we're still working on it. We're still going to bring down the numbers. We know we can't continue uh, on this rate of spending. We know that. So we're going to work to get the numbers down, and we're not going to wait two years after some convenient or inconvenient election. We're going to start our early next year or late this year, and uh, we're going to stay on it till we make the kind of changes that put us on a path to growth and prosperity. So I feel strongly about that, and I know people don't want to hear us talking about this bill or that bill, uh, who's for this and how many votes it has. They're tired of hearing that. They want us to make changes. And I don't think that the American people just want a deal. That's where the, the media spends it and politicians spend it. Is there a deal? Is there not a deal? The American people want us to change our debt course. They want us to get off the path that is taking us to financial destruction. And it really is. I don't know when it will happen, but everybody uh, says that uh, we cannot continue. And in a period of years, uh, we will be in a situation like Greece, and the numbers are pretty clear in that regard. There's no doubt about it. And it doesn't have to happen, so we can uh, do something about it. So the Republicans have passed a budget, a good budget, uh, that would reduce the debt and put us on a path to prosperity. Uh, that was rejected by our Democratic leaders. Indeed, they brought it up and mocked it. Uh, President Obama called for a conference at the White House. He put uh, Congressman Ryan, the brilliant young budget chairman in the House, right in front of him, and then he mocked and attacked the budget that the House did, who would actually do something for America and make us better. And he talks about, well, people are partisan around here. That, I, you know, I don't appreciate that. We've got to do something. I'm prepared to compromise. I'm, I feel deeply that we need to cut more spending than this, but we're at a point in history where we need to pass a debt ceiling increase. We just have to. But we don't need to quit talking about the problem. We need to continue the dialogue, continue the debate, and continue to look for and find ways to reduce spending. The House passed a cap and balance bill uh, that would have uh, capped spending and, and create a permanent constitutional amendment to uh, balance the budget, and then they passed the Boehner legislation that was voted down last night, and that legislation uh, would have cut all spending just about the amount that Senator Reid wants, the 900 or so billion dollars. He didn't exaggerate how much it was, uh, Speaker Boehner didn't, but he, he agreed to that amount and agreed to raise the debt ceiling immediately by an amount equal to uh, the uh, amount of spending we reduced over 10 years. A very generous, significant compromise from the position they believed was correct and that they took openly and publicly uh, through the normal legislative process when they pass their budget. So now our Democrats in the Senate, they haven't passed anything. Didn't even bring up a budget. Now it's 822 days since Congress has passed a budget. A budget was not passed here when my Democratic colleagues had 60 senators, 60 Democratic senators. They didn't pass a budget. Senator Reid said it would be foolish to pass a budget. Why is that? Well, he meant it would be foolish to have my members actually have to vote. And when you move a budget, it has priority. It can't be filibustered. It, ha it can be passed with a 50-vote margin. Uh, but you get to offer amendments. And people would have had to invite and voted on amendments. 
And the people who produced the budget would have to say how much taxes they were increasing, how much spending they were cutting, and how much debt was still going to be out there. And they did not want to expose themselves. They did not want to come before the American people and show where they stood. They preferred to bring up the House budget and vote it down and mock it while they weren't even, didn't have the courage, the leadership, or the responsibility to pass a budget themselves. They would show where they wanted to go with the future of America. It's just that simple. I hate to say it, but it is. We've avoided the budget process and uh, I don't think that the process is broken. I think we've broken it. So we've got to change how we do. We need to go back to the regular order in the Senate, and that means bringing up bills, having votes, having amendments, having people be accountable to their constituents. So if you're sitting back home, you, you want to see government reduce some of this reckless spending, don't you want to know how your constituents voted? Well, we've had no votes. And that's been the plan, to shield the members from votes so they could be held accountable. And for heaven's sakes, we don't want to have a vote in January or February when we have an election in November. Why, that's too close. People would see what we did. They might remember it when election day came up. They might not like it that I don't have a plan to do a better job of changing the un unconscionable debt course this country is on. So that's the way they think in Washington. It's not acceptable. And we're borrowing 40 cents of everything we spend. Every dollar we spend is borrowed. Mr. President, we have a um, time agreement at this point. Senator has five minutes and 20 seconds remaining. I thank the chair. Well, so it's a big deal, uh, and we need to get this done. And there are just not enough votes to pass the Reed Bill, and there's not enough votes to pass the Boehner Bill. That's just obvious. Even though uh, Speaker Boehner drew, drew down dramatically the amount of spending cuts that the House believes should be achieved, and so we've got to get our folks busy. And so while we're continuing to debate into the night, instead of actually recognizing that uh, the Reed bill doesn't have the votes to pass the Senate and absolutely doesn't have the votes to pass the House, it just doesn't. So we've got to, at this last desperate moment, hopefully our leaders will get busy, quit worrying about those things, and actually begin to suggesting something that we can work on. And we really shouldn't be in this position, and as I've explained at some length, uh, and I won't repeat it, but uh, I don't like it. I do not like it. I don't think it's right that we have a couple of senators and a couple of House members, our leaders, go off and, and somehow plop down on the Senate their solution to our problem, and if we don't pass it, the government is damaged and the economy is damaged because they've waited to the absolute 11th hour plus to produce it. It should never have happened that way. It's irresponsible, and it undermines the integrity of the entire congressional process. We've seen this coming all year long, and we should not have allowed it to happen in this way. Um, well, let me talk a little bit technically about the Reed Bill. It purports to reduce spending on, and savings by $2.4 trillion. That is not correct. Actually, it increases, uh, reduces the debt that would be increasing uh, by only $927 billion. And we've done our best for the Budget Committee staff uh, to be honest and fair about it. That's about the same number that Speaker Boehner has in his. But speak, the, the Majority Leader Reid insists his saves $2.4 trillion. Why? 
because if it's $2.4 trillion, he can justify it be put in the uh, next time we address this will be after the next election will be two years away. He doesn't cut that much, but he says he cuts that much, and it's not an accurate thing. Why is it not accurate? Well, they've got their uh, budget apparatchiks uh, uh, working into the night to see how they can make the accounting look better. They didn't like the 927 figure, so what do they do? They, they look at the budget projections uh, that it projected war costs would be coming down. Actually, we'll have a $40 billion reduction this year in the cost of Iraq and Afghanistan. Those costs are coming down. The president had projected they would come down to $50 billion soon and would stay at that uh, the rest of the year, which would mean $1 trillion less spending. Remember, we're going to increase debt by 9 to 13, but $1 trillion would have been the war. By reducing the war costs down, you save a $1 trillion. But that was already in the books. That's already estimated. And so how did they do it? Well, they came in and they put in a bill that mandated it to come down because, oddly enough, the Congressional Budget Office doesn't uh, assume the war costs will come down. The Congressional Budget Office assumes that it will uh, stay up and we'll spend this trillion dollars more on the war when there's no intent to do that. President Bush wouldn't have spent that much money. And therefore, they put it in the legislation and require it to come down to these numbers, and all of a sudden, CBO scores a trillion dollars extra savings without any change in spending, projections, or reality at all. Speaker Boehner didn't count his bill as reducing spending by that trillion dollars when he took the same numbers, same assumptions that spending on the war would come down. Uh, but they did that to try to make it look like they were reducing spending more, therefore could extend the debt limit more, and they could make it past the election, and they could get the political result they want. And that's really what it is. I'm just telling you, it's what it is. Um, well, um, another way to get a, another 300 billion gimmick is that if you assume a trillion dollar reduction in the war, then you're not paying interest on that money because we'd have to borrow it because we're already in debt and every amount of money that you can reduce means you borrow less money. Every less spending uh, provision uh, saves money and it also saves interest on that money. Well, it would be $300 billion in interest saved under the theory, the gimmick that's being used here. So that really amounts to $1.3 trillion in overestimating right there on the uh, amount of savings in the Reed plan. Mr. President, I thank the chair. I hope that we will uh, reject the uh, amendment, uh, the Reed proposal, and I hope our leaders can achieve in short order a change in our uh, plans for managing our money raise the debt ceiling, and begin to put this country on a sound path. I thank the chair and yield the floor. Mr. President. The senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm um, uh, happy to come to the floor with uh, two colleagues, a colleague from Minnesota and a colleague from Oregon, to speak about the damage created uh, by the Republicans' insistence on looking at just one side of the equation, failing to understand what businesses need to move forward, uh, in the next uh, 28 uh, minutes or so. As my good friend from Alabama leaves the floor, I want to say that I've enjoyed working uh, with him on many issues. Uh, we've been shoulder to shoulder advocating for Gulf Coast restoration and many other issues, but I have to strongly disagree with some of the points uh, that he's uh, just made, and we'll go into those uh, in just a moment. Part of the problem with the senator from Alabama and other senators on that side is that when they speak to the American people on this issue, they only talk about one side of the equation, and that is spending.
spending. They never, ever, ever talk about revenues. And anybody, any family, any individual, any business, any high school student, any college student understands like the commercial that's running on television now that talks about equations. Equations have two sides, not one. There's a spending side and there's a revenue side. So if your family budget is out of whack, you're spending too much, you're not taking in enough money, you could get a third job and fix that problem by bringing in more money to your budget or a second job or a part-time job and bring in more revenue and that problem is solved. Or you could not get another job and cut back spending all the way down to your income and solve your problem. The problem with the other side is they are disingenuous. They do not want to be truthful with the American people and say that not only do we have a spending problem, which all Democrats agree with, but we also have a revenue problem. And that's why we're on this floor fighting today. And I want to show beyond a shadow of a doubt the truth about what I'm speaking about. This is data from uh, CBO and OMB. This isn't Democratic data. This shows discretionary defense spending, all other spending, and mandatory programs for 10 years. In 10 years from 2001 until today, 10 years later, defense spending has increased $364 billion, 73%. And that is because we've had two wars and any number of defense and security issues. We can debate were those right or not. We've spent 73% more money adjusted for inflation. For mandatory programs, the increase has gone up in 10 years 310%. That's Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. This is the driver. This is the budget buster. Now, there are all sorts of solutions to that problem. Unfortunately, we're not talking about any of them today. But the, the push on the spending is coming from mandatory programs. What the Republicans fail to tell people, which makes me so angry and should make everyone angry, is that all other spending in the federal government has remained flat zero percentage increase in 10 years if you adjust for inflation. Zero. Not a 2% increase, not a 3% increase. Now, these are the facts. It's also true that we are spending more money, 25% of GDP, higher than any time since World War II. But that spending is being driven by defense and mandatory. But what do they want to cut? What are they demanding to be cut today? They are demanding this line item with agriculture, health, education, respite care for the elderly. This is what they want to cut. This is why Democrats are saying, wait a minute, take a couple of steps back. That's what this fight is really about. Now, in addition to waging this fight, you would think this is a big fight to have. We would have it in the safest place possible. Could I have order, please? We would be having it in the safest place possible. You know, in the old Western movies, when the two guys want to shoot it out, they say, meet me on the edge of town. Do these guys meet you on the edge of town? No. You know where they meet us? Right on Main Street, where small business and big business and self-employed have been struggling for years coming out of the greatest recession that in large measure they helped to create. Where do they want to stage this fight? On Main Street. That's what this fight is about. They could have chosen any place for this battle. But where did they choose it? They chose it over raising the debt ceiling, which if we don't fix in the next 72 hours, is going to raise interest on every business. I'm already getting piles of letters from Louisiana that I'm going to put in to this record from small business owners pleading with us to come to a deal because they're holding the economy hostage. Has anybody read the newspapers this morning? It is full of cartoons. Republicans holding the economy hostage. They're not holding Barack Obama hostage. They're not holding Democrats hostage. 
They're not holding the federal government hostage. They've decided to fight the battle on Main Street, holding business, economic growth hostage, and they think that that's a compromise or a fair fight. This hostage isn't strong enough to survive this siege. Do you ever hear any one of them say that perhaps we need to raise a penny or two or three? Absolutely no. Now, there are senators that have agreed to do so, but they haven't been as vocal as they possibly could be. I am honored to serve with many good Republicans that understand that this equation has two sides, both taking spending down in the right ways and raising revenues. And let me get one more fact out there, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. I understand corporate tax rates are, are higher than some other countries in the world, and our corporations are having some tough times in some businesses. But I'm going to submit data to this record that shows that the top 400 companies in this country are not paying a 35% rate. They're not paying a 34% rate. Their practical rate is 17%. Why would that be the case? Because this tax code is full of loopholes for special interest that many of them on the other side think is justified. So we're not going to be able to solve all these problems today, but I wanted to come to the floor on behalf of businesses, small businesses and large, and say, when the Republicans start talking about both sides of the equation, these Democrats, including myself, will walk up and negotiate. In the meantime, we're going to work hard to find a deal that works for the American people. And one solution that will work for the American people is not to have to repeat this four months from now. And I'm going to conclude with this. Just a few months ago, we were getting letters from the other side saying business needs certainty. Business needs to know what taxes they're going to pay. They need to know certainty. And then all of a sudden today, this side is arguing that we have to go through this debate four months from now. I'm telling you this hostage will not survive. Their siege. We have to fix this for the long term now. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague from Minnesota who's going to talk about the businesses in her state and what she's hearing from businesses in her state and why this is so grossly unfair from Republicans that want to bring this economy to its knees and they're doing a really good job of it. And I turn the floor over to the senator from Minnesota. The Mr. Senator President. from Minnesota. Well, thank you very much uh, to the Senator from Louisiana uh, for impassioned remarks. And there's a reason that she has that passion, and that is because we're in the ninth inning here. This is it. The time for political posturing is over. There's no more time to say we're not going to talk to each other. There's no more time to pretend that we can have one plan and then another plan. It's time to get an agreement. Look at what's happened in just the past week. The markets have gone down more than they have in over a year. We have seen realtors, and this is a study that just came out a few days ago, one out of six deals this past month people backed away from. Well, if you look at the month before, it was only one out of 25. People are feeling the uncertainty in this economy, and it is time to come to a bipartisan agreement. Last week, I held a call with business leaders from across my state to update them on the status of negotiations, to hear their thoughts and their concerns, to answer their questions. Their message back to me was clear and unified. If we fail to act, the consequences for our economy are real and serious. I will be honest. They don't care what combination of votes, Democrat, Republican, it takes to get us across the finish line. Many of them may prefer a Republican plan. Some would prefer a Democratic plan. But what they want is consistency. They want us to get this done. They want us to not default on our debts. They want a deal to be passed by August 2nd that prevents the United States from defaulting on its financial obligations and provides some long-term certainty. Now, make no mistake, they see our debt crisis as real and serious, something that must be addressed. But while failure to bring the national debt under control is threatening America's future, the danger of default is already harming our economy today. We must address both. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce has called the possibility of default unthinkable and unacceptable, arguing that it will have real, immediate, and potentially catastrophic consequences. As economists and experts from across the ideological spectrum, 
is this continues, interest rates will rise for everyone. That is what they say. This will mean higher rates for American consumers and the small businesses who drive our economies. Car loans, mortgages, businesses, and student loans will all be more expensive. Higher borrowing costs and a falling dollar means slower economic growth and slower job creation. That is the last thing we need right now. Just an hour ago, I received in my office an email from a major employer in my state saying that the commercial paper market nearly seized up yesterday, and by the afternoon, only overnight rollovers were possible. That's what they were seeing, and that was identical to what happened to capital markets in September of 2008, according to this major company. They said this in the email, the sooner the debt limit issue can be resolved, the sooner this market can begin functioning as it should, and the sooner lenders would begin lending for longer than overnight. Now here's some things that I heard from business leaders in my state. Uh, this is from Hubert Jolie, the president and CEO of Carlson Companies, headquartered in Minneapolis. It owns and manages over 2,000 hotels and restaurants across this country and across the globe. He writes this, as one of the largest private family-owned companies in the United States, Carlson would like to highlight how critical it is for Congress to reach a constructive compromise before August 2nd to ensure that the U.S. does not default on its debt obligations. The ongoing uncertainty, note that word, and lack of resolution of the debt ceiling debate is not healthy for the global financial markets or for consumer confidence. It is highly detrimental to the overall economy and to the travel and hospitality industry, which millions of families in the U.S. depend upon for their livelihood. We therefore urge congressional leadership to act in the best interests of the nation and deliver a compromise agreement that avoids default and demonstrates the nation has a credible plan to reduce the federal deficit. A short-term fix is not sufficient, as we must not allow or accept prolonged uncertainty, which will only create volatility and instability for the globe and the U.S. economy. Multiple other letters from snowmobile manufacturers, which I will later put in the record since we're having dozens come in every hour. I want to get them all gathered for tomorrow. But he says this, in regard to the current debt ceiling situation, default is not an option and reasonable compromise is what we need to add certainty that will lead to growth, growth for American manufacturers. Certainty and growth. Another one, the current debate over the debt ceiling has serious implications for American business. For example, the impact to my company will be felt not only by its 3,300 U.S. employees, but by suppliers, customers, and consequently shareholders. Just in case you don't draw the connection, these are major businesses that are in small towns throughout my state, sometimes the only major employer in those states. That's what they're saying. And let me tell you, these are not Democrats that are writing this letter. They are not siding on one particular plan or the other. They are just saying we need a compromise and we need it by August 2nd. Ken Powell, chairman and CEO of General Mills, a major Fortune 500 company, he writes, we think it is critically important for the entire country, both at the business and individual level, that Congress come to an agreement on this issue and move forward. A major financial institution that manages the savings and retirements of over 2 million individual business and institutional clients, he writes this, I urge the U.S. Congress to reach a bipartisan agreement to raise the debt ceiling and return the country's focus to economic growth and job creation. None of us in this chamber want to see our economy damaged. Democrats don't want it, Republicans don't want it, and as these letters show, the business community in this country knows that we cannot have this happen. What they want is for us to work together to show the American people and the world that Washington isn't broken, that instead we're willing to put aside our politics to do what we've been elected to do and get this done. That's what's right for America. Senator from Louisiana. Mr. President, thank you. Um, the Senator from Alaska is here to finish out this segment, which is focusing on the difficulties that business is going to have. And I thank the Senator from Minnesota for joining us for this segment. I just wanted to get one more thing on the record before yielding to the Senator from Alaska. 
I said the spending is high, 25% of GDP. Everyone acknowledges that. We're working hard to get it down. But I want to put in the record that revenues coming into the Treasury are the lowest since World War II at 14%. Now, we don't have revenues in this solution because Democrats have compromised and conceded on this point, which is a very difficult compromise for us to make when faced with the truth of the situation. But in trying to compromise, we have done that. We have not been met halfway, and I hope that the minority leader will re-engage with the majority leader. Uh, having said last night, he didn't feel like he wanted to engage with the majority leader to try to come to a compromise because businesses are depending on it. And finally, I want to put into the record a portion of an excellent um, a column in the Washington Post today to uh, capstone my remarks. And I thank the senator from Alaska, who's been an absolutely outstanding champion for small business, not only in Alaska, but around uh, the nation, to talk with us about this short-term repeat, six months uncertainty, and how damaging that will be to businesses in Alaska. And I thank the senator for joining us. Thank you very much to the senator of Louisiana. The senator from Alaska. Mr. President, and uh, I'm happy to join my friend from Louisiana, my friend from Minnesota. You know, I am a small business owner, have been from my teenage years. My wife is a small business owner. I understand the plight that they go through, how to raise capital, how to start a small business, how to take a dream to reality, and sometimes those dreams don't work out so well, and what happens next. You know, as we sit here and we talk about the short term versus the long term, in business, you lay out a business plan. It's a long-term plan. Businesses that set a short-term plan are the ones that say going out of business. Those are the big banners you read. Those are the short-term planners in the business world. We debate today, and I think we are a lot closer than maybe the media likes to portray, but it is a difference between the next six months do we deal with this issue and have another debt limit vote in six months from now and another six months later in six months, or do we plan for the long term, get our economy more stable, more certain, so businesses can invest and do the right thing. As I said at the beginning here, any business that you see that has a short-term plan usually has the sign that says going out of business or quitting. We're not going to quit here. We're going to have a long-term plan. And I heard earlier today uh, my colleague and friend from the other side uh, uh, who practices in real estate uh, from Georgia, Senator Isaacson. Both of us have been in the real estate business for many years. And as he said, also, we're closer than people think we are. But we have some slight differences, ones that we need to make sure we resolve and move to a long-term plan. I challenged earlier this week to businesses that wanted to have a short-term plan to call my office. I'd be happy to mention them on the floor of the Senate. I waited, and I waited, and I waited. No one, not one business, called my office and said, give me a short-term plan. But I will tell you, several Alaskan businesses did call my office and said, compromise, get a long-term plan. Let me read you just a couple. Joe Marie Thomas of Anchorage owns Crucible Designs, a web design firm, and she writes, I'm very concerned about the posturing surrounding the debt ceiling negotiation. As a small business owner, I'm already seeing the effects of this uncertainty. My clients are also small business owners, and I see, I, I am, so am I, right in the line of fire on this one. I've heard from more than a few clients that if the U.S. defaults on the debt, the resulting interest rates will put them out of business. With this fear increasing, the closer we get to August 2nd, it's re really hurting my bottom line. Another one, Rita Fleckstein from Anchorage, owns Rita's Family Daycare, a small daycare center for children. Her husband is a retired Air Force. It is my sincere hope that you will try to influence your other Alaskan partners to take a balanced approach to solve the current budget crisis. I'm a small business owner and a loyal Alaskan voter, and I'm tired of all this posturing among the House members. She's referring to the debate that occurred last night. A man from Anchorage. I'm a longtime Alaskan, father of two, Iraq War veteran, small business owner, and my small business provides engineering, engineers and managers to the oil and gas industry in Alaska. I'm a registered independent, but I am conservative. 
in regards to the budgetary issues. As a small business owner, I would never jeopardize the well-being of my family, my employees, and my clients regards to the business agreement or transaction. There is always room for compromise and allow all parties to engage in a deal to walk away with feeling they got a fair deal. I fully expect increases in my taxes, and I'm okay with that, in order to continue to support our country. Another one, actually someone who I know well, who owns Arctic Wire and Rope, owned by Eric McCollum. He won the Alaska Manufacturer of the Year in 1986, employs 14 employees. He is important to our oil and gas industry. Fortunately, Eric has no debt, but he is terribly concerned about the debt crisis. He's a small business owner, and like his, are the canary in the mine shaft and will negatively impact more big businesses. There will be far more impact to Main Street than Wall Street from this debt crisis, Eric states. Eric adds that he's more than willing to pay his fair share to help balance the federal budget. These have come in and in and in, and it's amazing to see what people are talking about in my state. 68,000 small businesses in Alaska. My wife's one of those. 15,000, almost 16,000 employ many employees. It's the fastest growing segment of our business community in Alaska is small business, so growing by almost 31% over the last six years. Mr. President, to my colleagues, to the Senator from Louisiana, as a small business person, all they want to see is certainty. They want the bickering, the partisan bickering to end. They want certainty so they can continue to invest and see their future. So there are just some simple differences that I think the folks from both sides can sit down and work through. One is clearly how long should this debt limit increase go for. As I said earlier, you do a short term, that's the business that's saying, I quit, I'm out of business. You do long term, it gives certainty and opportunity to plan and build for the future. Should we have a vote up or down separate from the debt limit issue on a balanced budget amendment? It's a great debate. More than likely, we'll probably have that debate here. I've supported a balanced budget amendment before. But it is time we raise the debt limit to create the long-term certainty we need for our small business community, not only in Alaska, but throughout this country, where they are the backbone that will drive this economy in the right direction. Mr. President, it's just an honor again to be down here with the chairwoman of the Small Business Committee. She has worked tirelessly, bill after bill. We were unsuccessful this year on a couple that were critical to small business because we couldn't get past the log jam here. Maybe this will break the pathway if we can get past this debt limit in a bipartisan way that we can then bring many more of those small business bills back to the floor because what I hear most often from Alaskans, besides the frustration of what's going on here, is they want us to focus on building this economy, to get regulation out of the way, to help invest in the needed things, to ensure that businesses can create the jobs that we desperately need, not only for the people who are unemployed today, but the future generations. That's what we need. So again, Mr. President, I thank you for the opportunity. And again, to my friend from Louisiana, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words, but your leadership and your continued tenacity to fight for the small business person every single day. I yield. I thank the Senator, Mr. President. How much time? I thank the senators again from Minnesota and Alaska for coming and making the point and underlying and scoring the point that this uh, filibuster that the Republican caucus uh, is, uh, is holding today, not allowing us to have a simple majority vote on the Reed plan, is hurting business. And as the senator said, this is a pattern, unfortunately, it seems like, coming from the other side. We had to overcome their filibuster just last year to pass the small business uh, bill that is now having a terrific effect throughout the country in some pockets. We still are not where we'd like to be, of course, in job creation, and the recovery is slow. I'm starting to think that maybe that's what they want for the recovery to be slow because then they filibustered the SBIR bill, which is the largest single research investment program for small business in America. We still can't get that passed 
They're filibustered. Then they filibustered the EDA bill, which is one of the most important programs to chambers of commerce, which are not a liberal stronghold in America. And now they're filibustering this bill and demanding a two-step solution, which no business person has written to Congress saying they think that's a good way to go. The opposite. They're saying, get this over with now. The uncertainty is killing us. And yes, I'll yield to the senator from Alaska. Just for a question, the way I understand this is, for people who may be watching or listening, a filibuster requires 60 votes. All we're asking for is the same thing that the House of Representatives did last night on their bill. Simple majority. Simple majority. Allow an up or down vote so we can determine what plan or what action we're going to That's all we're asking and it will for. Be clear, Is that fair? Yes, and it would be clear if we could get 51 votes, the Reed plan would pass, just like the Boehner plan passed. Neither one can get the, the, the other side to agree, but at least we would then have the basis for a compromise but no, the Republicans have decided we can't have that vote, and so this thing is getting strung out. And with every hour, with every day, businesses are hurting. Maybe that's what they want, because then the president can be blamed for business not doing well when they're the ones that are stepping in the way. I want to submit for the record the details uh, from the budget um, summary. Uh, that I stated and put this into the record, Mr. President, 14 percent. That objection. 14 percent of the revenues coming in. This is on the website for anybody that wants to know. And I'm going to submit records, uh, letters from Louisiana uh, to the record for businesses that have written to me saying, not a two-step process, a one-step process, get a good solution and move on. I yield the floor, Mr. President, and I, I thank the senators again for coming down and sharing their concerns. And I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. President, the Senator from Arizona. Mr. President, I ask that for the proceedings in the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd, I'd like to begin by speaking for just a moment about some comments that the distinguished majority leader um, uh, gave this morning in his uh, opening comments, and then um, talk a little bit about the general issue that we're faced here, frankly, in an effort to see if we can come to common ground. Um, let me start with, uh, with a couple of things that the, that the majority leader said this morning. He has talked more than once about the fact that, in his view, the Republican leaders have wasted time by pursuing a proposal that they knew the Senate wouldn't pass. I think there are two things to say about that. Uh, one could say the same thing about the majority leader's proposal. He knows that the Senate will not pass that either. So you have two proposals one by Speaker Boehner that passed the House of Representatives, but Senator Reid declared dead on arrival here, and indeed it was tabled last night. And the other, the Reid proposal, which is also dead on arrival here in the Senate. Uh, as Leader McConnell noted this morning, there is a letter that has sufficient signatures on it to defeat it. And in addition to that, um, I can tell you that I have talked to my colleagues, all of my Republican colleagues, and it will be defeated. And I think the majority leader knows that. So the only question with regard to the Senate uh, majority leader's proposal is um, why would we waste additional time uh, debating a proposal we know is going to fail? Uh, why have that vote at 1 a.m. tomorrow morning? Let's get it done, get it over, and move forward. I really think that's the best way to uh, try to reach a conclusion here. I would also note that the reason that the majority leader declared the Boehner proposal dead was for two reasons, really. One, because it had a balanced budget amendment uh, attached to it. And I just want to make the point that I know that most of my Democratic colleagues don't support a balanced budget amendment. But I do think it's worth noting that, depending on which poll, 70, 80, more than 80 percent of the American people support a balanced budget amendment. And I don't think you can blame Speaker Boehner for including a balanced budget amendment in the Boehner legislation that was sent over here. 
It's pretty logical that the American people say they support something with that degree of support that you would include it in legislation to try to balance the budget. But the majority leader here said, nope, that means it's dead on arrival in the Senate. Well, that should tell you something about the Senate Democrats. President Obama talks about the need for a balanced approach. Speaker Boehner says, how about a balanced budget? Leader Reid says, no. Well, that's the first point. It seems to me that the second point is that uh, there is a difference of opinion about how long this debt ceiling extension should last. Speaker Boehner has always said there should be at least a dollar for dollar reduction in spending for every dollar that the debt ceiling is increased. And I think that makes sense. If we're going to increase the debt ceiling $2.4 trillion, then we'd ought to have $2.4 trillion in savings. Otherwise, we're just going to heap, keep on having to raise the debt ceiling over and over and over again. And I would note that the savings are savings that occur over a 10-year period of time, so it's not like we're cutting that immediately. Although the debt ceiling extension would be $2.4 trillion for just the next 16 months. That's how much debt we're going to accumulate just to the end of President Obama's term in office. There isn't enough savings to do that that's been agreed to. Republicans have all kinds of ideas about saving that could get to $2.5 trillion. Democrats have said no. The only thing we can agree on is about $1.2 trillion. And so the Republican leader said, fine, then let's do a debt extension equal to $1.2 trillion. That takes us at least through the end of the year. And then we'll have a committee. Both sides agree that we need to have a select committee that will make recommendations for how to get the remainder of the savings and potentially more. And that's a good idea. Uh, but uh, the president has said he doesn't want to rely on that process because maybe it won't result in um, actual savings that, uh, uh, that he can count on. He might have to veto it. Or for whatever reason, he's not confident that it would occur. And uh, he doesn't want to have to face this issue again during the time that he's campaigning for election. And I don't blame him for that. Um, he might well view it as a distraction. It certainly is uh, unsettling to the markets. But I would argue that as much as uh, it's a result we would like to avoid, uh, by the same token, it does focus public's attention on what we need to do around here, which is reduce spending. We didn't get into this mess uh, for any other reason other than the fact that we've spent too much money. We've had annual uh, spending of about um, $1.2 trillion since President Obama became president. We've had annual deficits of about $1.4 trillion. Do you see any connection there? <laughs> Obviously, our problem is spending. So we need to get a handle on that. And that's why I think the Boehner proposal made sense. But the leader says it's dead on arrival, and he was right. The Reid proposal is also dead on arrival. Let's get it over with and move on to a solution that we can agree with. Second thing I just wanted to mention, the majority leader uh, has been very critical of what he calls Tea Party extremists, people who just do not want to vote to increase the debt ceiling under any circumstances. It kind of reminds me of Senator Barack Obama, who voted against extending the debt ceiling. And the language is eerily similar. It's failed leadership, he pronounced. Tea Party folks say this represents failed leadership, so we're not going to vote for a debt extension. And the president didn't vote for the debt ceiling extension when he was a member of this body. Now, I don't say that to criticize the president, but rather just to suggest to my colleagues that we ought to have the same standard apply to all. If they think it's wrong for the Tea Party people to stand on principle and say we're not going to raise the debt ceiling, then they can say the same thing about President Obama when he was a senator. But if they're going to criticize the Tea Party folks for standing on principle, criticizing leadership, saying they don't want to raise the debt ceiling, they might want to think about what their colleague then Senator Obama did. The fact of the matter is, name-calling doesn't help here. Let's stop talking about extremist Tea Party folks. I won't call the president an extremist when he voted against the debt ceiling extension. He's already admitted that he made a mistake. And Republicans in the leadership in both the House and Senate have made it clear that we believe the debt ceiling should be extended. We want to be able to do that for a variety of reasons that we've discussed. We do not want to put the American economy in jeopardy. We don't want to jeopardize the savings of people who uh, uh, could see those savings dissipate if the stock market continues to go down, and so we do need to, uh, to, to get this issue behind us. The majority leader complained this morning that Republicans need to come talk to him. The majority leader needs to come talk to him. He said, I would have uh, 
hoped that someone would come to us, come to the table, and, uh, and he specifically referred to uh, Senator McConnell. And I, my response is, why do the Republicans always have to come up with the ideas? You know, three times the House of Representatives has passed a proposal only to be criticized each time by the Democrats who invite them to come up with proposals. You remember the first was the Ryan budget, savaged by my Democratic colleagues and by the President. House Republicans said yes, Senate Democrats said no. Then they came up with cut, cap, and balance, something that's pretty popular around the country. Would cut spending, would cap it, and would ultimately have a balanced budget amendment that would keep it capped. Democrats roundly criticized that. In the Senate, they voted it down. And so finally, John Boehner came up with his last proposal. And uh, it also included a balanced budget amendment, declared dead on arrival. Third time, Democrats say no. And I, I'm just getting, I, I, I think Republican leaders are getting a little tired of being invited by our Democratic friends to come up with ideas, only to have them voted down and criticized. And where is the Democratic proposal? Where is the proposal by the President? Um, I think it's time for Democrats to come up with an idea, and maybe Republicans can take a look at it and see whether we like it. Finally, the majority leader said that we've got another filibuster in our path. They, meaning Republicans, stall and delay. Well, last night, Leader McConnell said, let's have the vote tonight, right now. We don't need to stall or delay another minute. The majority leader said, no, I don't want to vote on my proposal yet. I want to vote at it, on it at 1 a.m. on Sunday morning. Leader McConnell said today, we're ready to vote on it today, without delay. Now, at 3 o'clock, at 6 o'clock, whatever, let's vote on it. We don't need to continue to waste time. The majority leader said, no, we'll vote on it at 1 a.m. Sunday morning. Okay, I'll be here. But I wonder what the American people think of such a dysfunctional body that we can't even, by unanimous consent, bring a matter to the Senate floor, vote on this motion to proceed, uh, to invoke cloture to, to proceed to the leader's bill. Well, those are some things that I just wanted to comment on that, uh, the, that the leader had to say. Uh, uh, finally, what I'd like to do is to put into the record, uh, Mr. President, I'll ask unanimous consent to insert at the close of my remarks a Wall Street Journal editorial called The Road to a Downgrade, dated July 28th. Without objection. Thank you. And let me quote from... Uh